All right, so we had, uh, let me start from the beginning of last week. So last week we were uh, discussing the multi-regression analysis and uh, we started with a model that had like just one X, which is the single regression. And then we uh, were able to add additional X and we were analyzing the impact, which is the slope of this regression, um, which is basically the impact of a one unit change in XI on YI. And then uh, we expanded the model by adding additional axes, and this is what we call the multi-regression analysis. And um, every time we have axes, we count them by the case. So K1, K2, K3, K4, all the way up to the last one, uh, K, and then we have also an intercept, okay? So what we're planning to do today, we, last time we covered the, how we find the coefficients using the multi-regression analysis. Uh, we discussed the assumptions. I gave you an example and I showed you how to do it in Stata. Um, before moving onwards to today's topic, I am um, going to discuss um, what we call the measures of fit. The measures of fit, I told you last time, these are available in one of the videos uh, that I have on my YouTube channel. And this video um, covers the different measures of fit. So I was um, thinking that I would like quickly go over it instead of not going over it at all because I was depending that uh, you guys are gonna watch the video, but just I wanna make sure because these are uh, very important um, topics. So let me um, go over these uh, quickly and then I'm going to show you how to read them, how to interpret the results based on these numbers or the numbers that we will get. So the measures of fit are actually um, so Measures of fit, after you're done with estimating your model, you wanna make sure whether this model was, um, is, is good or, or it still needs some uh, improvement. So you get a model like this, uh, yi equals beta naught plus beta one xi, right? And uh, let me make it a simple model and then UI, and we call this just the population regression line, okay? The population regression line, which is unknown, we, which we don't know what is the values of these betas, but we do the um, ordinary least squares by, by minimizing the sum of the squared errors, um, which is basically the distance between the true and the estimated. Right, so when I say the true, it's just another way of saying the population regression line and the estimate or the prediction of y i hat, which is based on all the hats, right? So x i doesn't have an error term. The distance between these two would give us the error term, and this is what we said last time. So the error term or the estimated error term is the difference between my true observation and my estimation. And I hope actually that this would be as small as possible. I actually hope that this is equal to zero, but this won't be the case because it's very hard to get this distance equal to zero, all right? So the distance between these two is called the errors or the error term. And if I sum them up and square them, right? If I sum from I equal one to N, and I square them, we call it the sum of squared errors, okay? Sum of the squared errors, and then it's abbreviated SSR, sum of the squared errors. So you just get the error term, and then you square it up, you sum it, and then you just get SSR, okay? So you get the distance, you square it, and you sum it, okay? So by the end, it's just one number, okay? Um, Next, so this is just a background, right? Um, 
to get the measure of fit, we do something called a variance decomposition analysis. So again, I know that the true is equal to an estimation, right? Plus an amount of error, okay? So if I can subtract the error term out, I'm sorry, if I can subtract the mean out, then I'm going to do like yi minus y bar. This is not an i, this is just y bar because it's just one number, it doesn't move between observations, right? Equal y i hat minus y bar, and I'm kind of subtracting y bar from both sides, so it's equivalent, plus ui, okay? And next, what I'm gonna do is, if I'm summing this up, over all observations, and I'm doing the same here. I don't have a space, but I'm summing them up over all observations, and I'm summing this up over all observations, and I'm squaring this, I'm squaring this, and I'm squaring this, okay? So what we did is, this is the definition of the true observation, the population observation is just an estimate error, right? If I add these up, I will get my true population number or the true population observation. Now, what we're doing here is just rewriting them. Uh, subtract the mean out, sum, and square everything. So if I do so, we call this one as the first component, we call it the total sum square. Then the second component, we call it the explained sum square and you know the next one you know this the sum of squared residue which is the one that i had in the previous slide right which is this one the ssr okay i said error you can call it residual okay so ss some textbooks they actually call it sse some textbooks they call it the ssr so let me just uh, since i abbreviated as ssr i'm gonna call it ssr okay but it's the same thing. So some of the squared residual, again, you can call it error, it's okay. So I'm gonna keep it with residual, okay? And I can abbreviate this as TSS is equal to ESS plus SSR, okay? The total variation, and you can call this one the variance decomposition analysis because this one is telling me that this is called the sample variance is equal to, or the sample variance of yi is equal to the sample variance of yi hat, right? Plus the sample variance of the ui hat. So this is called the variance decomposition analysis, okay? And what's the idea behind that? Um, again, the total variation in the model can be decomposed into two components, a part that I can explain because it's coming from here and the yi hat is coming from beta hat naught plus beta hat one x. So I can explain it, right? I can estimate it. So we call it explain. So I can explain it or estimated, and another part that is not explained or unexplained or the error term. So because this part is unexplained or we call it the error term, I actually need to minimize this as much as I can, maximize this as much as I can, such that the total variation of the model are explained, right? Are predicted, I'm able to estimate them. So the measures of fit that we are using are actually based on this idea. I'm trying to see what is the ratio of the explanation of the model versus the total variation in the model. And I hope this part divided by this part to give me like 100%, right? I hope that these are actually equal or as much as possible close to the 100% explanation. So this is actually the source or the main kind of the background behind the R square. So the first one, which is, the R square. 
okay the r squared or we write it as this way what is the r squared the r squared is just a statistic right the statistic that is used to it measures the fraction of the variance of y i that is explained and the word explained is very important by x i and here i'm assuming that they just had one x but if i have multiple x's then the extent of the explanation of x1 x2 x3 up to x k uh, for the variations of y okay and it's actually uh it ranges from zero to one or you can multiply it times 100 and say zero to zero to 100 percent and you hope that you move as much as possible to the 100 percent explanation okay um, so how can i measure it so if i want to measure this it's basically equal to the two components um two uh, two of the components that i just explained it's the ess over the tss again we go back it's the explained sum squared over the total sum squared i want to know to what extent my model can explain the variations in yi so you can actually open the numerator and say okay it's the total sum squared minus the ss are over the total sum squared, right? So you open this part up, it's basically the difference between the total sum squared minus the sum of the squared results. And then it is commonly written this way as SSR over TSS, okay? And of course, if I get the R squared, like the extreme values of the R squared, this is the worst case ever, right? When I get explanation of zero, my model does not explain anything. The model that I came up with does not explain anything. So this one implies that the explanation ESS is simply equal to zero. This is the, like actually very bad result, right? So you actually want to avoid this result. You wanna be closer to the one. The other extreme, which is the best case scenario is that if the R squared is one to make this one, then these two has to, they have to be equal, right? So my explain sum squared is simply equal to the total explanation or the total, I mean, variation in the model. So the total variation in the model is 100% explained. And this is the, the best result ever, right? So the best result, I should say, this is not bad. I should say this is the worst, right? So we are comparing. So the worst in the, so this is the, this is actually the worst result ever that you can get. And this is the best result ever. Okay. Any questions? Okay, I'm looking at the chat. Do you have any questions? Just type. Any questions? Okay, good. All right, so it's only Dan who responded. I assume the others don't have any question. If you do, just uh, just stop me or type anytime, okay? All right, so. The next measure, and I remember, like I'm saying, it's just um, a simple model, right? I. Uh, I didn't um, have more than one X. So it's a very simple model. So let's continue with this simple model and see what about the next measure of fit. The next measure of fit, which we call the standard error of the regression. And the standard error of the regression is abbreviated as SER. So the SER is actually uh, based on the error term in the model, okay? So the error term in the model, let me go back. I said I have 
a part that is related to the explanation. And this is, um, if I divide this by this, I get the R square. If I focus on this part, then I'm focusing on the second measure, which is the standard error of the regression, which I want to minimize as much as possible. So the standard error of the regression, it's a standard error. So we have to see a square root, right? So it's equal, so the SER is equal to the square root of the sum of the squared residuals over an adjustment for degrees of freedom, n minus two. And then when you ask me, why is it two? Because I'm just assuming I have a simple model, right? That has only x1. So if I open this up, it's yi minus yi hat, right? It's the sum from i equal one to n squared, which is the error term, right? This distance is called the error term. And if I open this one up, it's made out of beta hat not plus beta hat one x. So how many parameters I'm estimating? I'm estimating one and two, right? And that's why I'm adjusting for two degrees of freedom because I'm only estimating two coefficients. If I have multiple coefficients, if I have k coefficients, then we will need to change this as I'm going to show you um, later, okay? For now, I'm just explaining a simple model that only has, uh, has one x, all right? So again, the, um, the SER, as you can see, it's made out of the SSR and the SSR is made out of the y's. So by the end, the SSR is going to take the same unit of measurement as YI. So if YI is distance and distance is in miles, then the SER is going to also be in miles. If the YI is a test score in points, uh, then the SER is going to be also in points. So it always follows the unit of measurement of YI. And this is different than the R squared. The R squared is in percent, or you can make it in fract. Or it's actually in a fraction, but you can make it in percent, I should say. Um, uh, so when you see, see it reported in state, it's always a fraction. But when you analyze it, we tend to analyze it in percentages, okay? So this one is, a, again, following the unit of measurement of the uh, dependent variable, okay? So the next measure is actually following from the SER and we call it the root mean squared error and it's abbreviated as root mean squared error okay e and this one is actually similar to the SER the only difference is it does not adjust for degrees of freedom. So it just divides by N. So it's equal to same equation, right? As uh, I mean, same formula over N. So we don't adjust for degrees of freedom. It just takes the sample, the whole sample without any adjustment. And I'm sure that you can imagine like if I have a large sample, if I have 1000 people, if I'm dividing here by 1000 and here if I'm dividing by 1,000 minus two, right, 998, it doesn't matter, right? The, 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 simple, the sample is already large, so it won't matter whether I'm adjusting for degrees of freedom or not. So we usually work with a large sample. Of course, like we, like we usually work something around 200, 300, 400, still it's considered a large sample. So you won't see a large difference between SER and the root mean squared error because of, uh, we're using a large sample. However, if you're using just a sample of 10 or any number that is less than 30, you would be able to see a difference or a gap between these two numbers. They would not be close to each other, okay? So they would give you very, very close results, assuming that you have a large uh, sample size. Okay, so what if I have uh, more than one X. How can these measures of fit change? So if I have a model that is a multi-regression model, right? If I have a multi-regression model that has more than one X, so Y, I is equal to beta naught plus 
beta 1 x 1 i plus beta 2 x 2 i and then we keep going and then plus the last one is k beta k x k i plus u i so this is a multi regression model okay when i have a multi regression model then um I'm going to still have measures of it, but they're going to be a little bit different. The R square is the same, so there is no change in the R square, but we have an additional measure related to the R square, which is called the adjusted R square. So the adjusted R square is used when I have more than one X, and as the name suggests, it do adjust for degrees of freedom. So it has the same formula in the sense that it's one minus s s r over t s s but it has here some adjustment right here and the adjustment is based on how many again coefficients i'm estimating so i have n minus one over n minus k minus one y n minus one and y n minus k minus one so the n minus one is related actually to the TSS. You can, you can actually write it this way. Let me write it in a different way. So it's both are correct, but just want to make it easy. So you can write it this way. Okay, so it's gonna be like each one is divided by its own degrees of freedom. So this one has a degrees of freedom of n minus one and this one n minus k minus one. Okay, so you either write it this way or the other way I just wrote. So why I have here n minus one? Because if I open this one up, this one has a y i minus y i hat square and sum, right? So I have one, sorry, that's one, it's my mistake. Let me just remove this. This is bar, okay? So it has just one, one parameter to be estimated, which is the y bar, which is the mean of y. Okay, so that's why we're just subtracting one that stands for the adjustment of degrees of freedom because I'm estimating or I'm losing information for estimating the mean of y. Next, um, next, so this one, the SSR, if I open this one up, then it's going to be the error term, the sum of the squared of the error term, but I can uh, just make it a shortcut. It's gonna be like yi minus yi hat squared sum if I open this one up, it would give me this whole thing up to here without the error term, okay? But it has all the hats, so I'm estimating this one hat, okay, beta naught hat, so this is one, and that's why I have the one here. So the one here stands for the intercept, and then I have one, two, three, four, all the way up to K. So this is the K. So K stands for the coefficients multiplied with the X's and the one stands for the intercept, okay? So the adjusted uh, R square um, is used when I have more than one X and it's actually uh, like preferred to the R square because it doesn't have to increase every time I'm adding a new coefficient. Uh, I mean like a new value, I should say. So the R square has a disadvantage that every time I'm adding um, a variable, it keeps on increasing. And this is regardless whether this variable is contributing to something with, to this regression or not. So the adjusted R square is different because it doesn't have to increase every time. Why it doesn't have to increase? Because every time I'm adding um, an additional regressor, and when I say regressor additional X, it has two effects. One effect, we call it a positive effect, and another effect is the negative effect. The positive effect is coming from the fact that every time I'm adding a new variable, the SSR decreases, the amount of error decreases, okay? So the positive effect is coming from the fact that SSR keeps on decreasing every time I'm adding an additional variable. However, the negative effect is that the um, adjusted R squared decreases. Why it decreases? Because every time I'm adding a new variable, this K part increases, right? And if K increases, then the adjusted, if K increases, this implies the adjusted 
R square decreases. Just follow the negative sign and then it's in the denominator of the numerator and it has a negative sign here. So you will end up, mathematically, you will end up by having the adjusted R square is falling. This one has a positive effect, which means that adjusted R square is increasing. So the adding additional regressor doesn't have to increase the adjusted R square. It would depend on which effect is stronger. Is it the positive or the negative? If the positive is bigger, then the adjusted R square would increase. If the negative is bigger, then of course it would uh, fall. And if they are equal, then it would stay the same. Okay, so that's why it's actually preferred because it would give us like more meaningful uh, result as compared to the regular R square or just the R square. And again, I'm, I'm gonna repeat this every time I'm adjusting for degrees of freedom. If I have a large sample size, this adjustment of degrees of freedom is like, not, is not needed. Because if I have a large sample size, I'm just gonna clean. I'm not saying I'm going to remove it, but I'm just cleaning. Um, so every time uh, I have a large sample size, I'm gonna end up by really the adjustment of degrees of freedom is not needed, okay? And, uh, but it's there, okay? So we have to keep it in the equation. And then when I'm running an, a, a model and I'm seeing the results and I'm saying, okay, why is it, why they are very close, I have to uh, understand that this might be the case that I have a large sample size, okay? Okay, so this is for the adjusted R square. So we, how many we have now? This is two, this is three. Adjusted R square is number four. Okay, all right, what else? In a multi-regression model, I have to modify SER. So SER in multi-regression uh, model would look like this. I know that I said the SER is equal to the square root of the SSR over N minus two, right? This is what we had here, N minus two. And I said Y two is it's because I'm estimating one and two, okay? Now I'm going to adjust, if I do have a model that has one, two, three, four up to K, and I also have the beta naught, then I have to adjust this in the numerator here. So I, I mean, the denominator here. So I have to remove this one and I have to correct the degrees of freedom by saying, okay, it's N minus K minus one, where K is for how many betas attached to the axis and the one stands for the intercept. And this is going to be the, our measure uh, in a multi-regression analysis. And remember that most of the time um, we in econometrics, we are actually working with more than one X, right? Uh, just one X is a very, very simple model, but in real life, in real estimation analysis, we're actually working with at least five X's in the model, right? And then we keep expanding, we keep varying the model as we're gonna see in the course. Um, what else? The root mean squared error squared error in uh, a multi-regression analysis. It's gonna be the same actually. So it's gonna be the same as the single regression analysis. Okay. And this is exactly the case as the R square itself. The R square is the same in a multi-regression versus uh, a single regression as the same equation. But of course, the content of the equation is different, right? Because the R square, as I said, it's the ESS over the TSS, whatever is inside the explained sum square, which is coming from the Y i hat minus Y bar. This Y i hat has the big model, right? Has the, has the model that has all uh, the axes, okay? So it's exactly the same equation. So we're not gonna change anything. Um, it's just, uh, I'm just repeating it. It's the same. What is, what is different now is the model itself has more than one X. The estimation also has more than one X. That's it, but the equation is exactly the same. The root mean squared error is exactly the same. So, so you can think of the R square has an adjustment 
called the adjusted R square. The root mean squared error has an adjustment, and this adjustment is called the standard error of the regression. So there are important uh, things to note about um, adjusted R square because most of the time we would we would depend on the adjusted R square because we have more than one x and because also uh, we prefer to depend on it. We don't it doesn't have to increase every time I adding a new uh, uh, regressor. Okay, so. Um, let me just mention a few things about the R square itself. So the R square increases every time um, we add a new regressor or the new X, okay? The adjusted R square uh, I'm sorry, my handwriting is just terrible. Okay, it doesn't necessarily increase uh, when regressor. Okay, they both have the same range from zero to one. Both, this is the best, this is the worst, okay? And um, they would never tell you what, what you're missing, right? So let's say I have a model that is yi equal to beta naught plus beta one x uh, i uh, or x one i. Uh, plus ui and then I'm estimating this model and I'm getting the r square or the adjusted r square let me call it one because this is the first model and then suppose I have another model beta naught plus beta one x one i plus x two i plus ui and I, and I estimated it and I got another r square and I'm calling it r square two or if I'm doing it with the adjusted R square, so this two, if it is just the R square, it would definitely increase. If it is the adjusted R square, it doesn't have to increase, as I said, it depends on which force is stronger, whether it is positive or the negative, okay? But in both cases, they would never tell you what, are, what you're missing in the model, right? You, they will never tell you, okay, you're missing X5, you're missing X3, it doesn't tell you this. It just tell you, okay, whatever you have explains this amount. It's all about the word explain, okay? So it's all about the explanation uh, of the model. Okay, so let me give you an example. If I have, um, something like this. I have an example, um, average hourly earnings. Okay, so this is the average this is the average hourly earnings. Okay, so, or in other words, you can call it earnings per hour, doesn't matter, okay? And then I'm estimating this, so it has a hat, equal to 1.08 plus 0.60 age. So this model has an explanation of 0 0.029. In other words, my R square here is, you multiply this times 100, it's very low, right? There is only 2.9% explanation of the variations in average hourly earning. Or you can say it this way, age explains 2.9% of the variations in average hourly earning okay that's it and it's estimated 
Of course, I want to maximize this explanation as much as I can. So suppose that you included another variable as in like in the second uh, step. So you estimated, re-estimated the model by adding another variable that represents the uh, gender um, of the individual. So you have this one plus 0 0.59 age minus 2.533 female, where this one is takes one if the individual is female and zero for male. So this one for female and this one for male. And this sign is expected because if I'm assuming there is a discrimination in the market, then being a female decreases average hourly earnings by $2.533 an hour, okay? Um, each additional unit increase in age and the unit of it is a year. So if the increase in age by one year or as the person um, gets older by one year, earning increases by $0.59 an hour. Okay. And I'm sure that you know how to uh, interpret the intercept by saying at zero age and at zero gender, average hourly earning is equal to $2.57 an hour. Okay, and as I said before, it doesn't have to have an uh, economic meaning, but it has a mathematical meaning. It's an intercept of the relationship. So um, let's return to what we're focusing on. So we're focusing on the explanation of the model. So you got uh, the model like this, and then um, the results are, you get R squared is equal to 0 0.0442. And then the adjusted R square is 0 0.0440. Now we're comparing this model versus this model. Let's call this one model one, model two. And of course, what you can say is adding the gender factor has increased the explanation of the model. You can say that female and age explain Actually, it's very small, right? It's still small. 4.42% of the variation in average hourly earning hat. Still very small. And as, you, uh, as we proceed in this course and as you move to the next level of econometrics course, we will keep expanding this model and discussing possible uh, variations in this model to capture all the possible uh, functional forms of this uh, regression. So it might be the case that I need age and age square. There are so many other factors affecting the person's earnings, experience, education, um, uh, ability, motivation, right? Economic background of the person, many things. So, this is just a very simple model and the small variation is expected given that this is a very, very simple model does not capture all the possible factors explaining or estimating earnings. What about the adjusted R square? I can see the difference between these two is very small. One is zero point, um, let me just do this here. Okay, one is 0 0.44 or 4.42 and the other one is 4.40. Why? It's actually because in this sample, I didn't tell you that. So the sample size here in this model is equal to 570 people, individuals. Okay, so it's like a large sample size. So the adjustment of degrees of freedom really does not make any difference. Okay, or it makes like slight, very slight difference. Okay. Um, an important point to note is um, whatever I'm, I'm talking about the R square or the adjusted R square, it's all about one word. It's all about the explanation. That's it. And that's why we say ESS. So it's all about the explanation. And we said this is called the variance decomposition. So it's an explanation of the variation. And that's why we call it variance decomposition, right? Um, so it would give us, as you can see here, just a number but it doesn't tell you what you're missing. It doesn't tell you, okay, uh, you have a, a misspecification problem, you're missing other variables, but it doesn't tell you what are the variables that you're missing, okay? So this would be like something that you can find out based on reading previous papers, 
what people have um, added in a model that starts with average hourly earning as a dependent variable and maybe you can find out based on um, previous research or based on your study on what are the factors affecting the average hourly earning okay um, let me uh, show you your slides. So I'm going to share with you your slides. Uh, so the slides of this week. Actually, I'm going to have it on my iPad. So I'm not going to do a new share. So this is on the iPad. So let me show it to you here. So. We have uh, slides from last week. So last week, actually not last week, the week before. So we had chapter 11. So when you look at chapter 11, and this is very important. This is the start of econometrics, like the actual econometrics in the course starts in chapter 11, where we start with the uh, same regression analysis. And um, I want you to look at, uh, it's all important, but I want you to, Let's focus on this example, which is in page or slide 16. What do we have in this example? Is a simple model, right? In this simple model, oh, I'm sorry. So I said 16. So we have a very simple model where we have housing prices. Okay, so we have housing prices. This is my dependent variable. It's in thousands. You have to make sure that you understand that uh, what is the unit of measurement of your dependent variable. So you have house prices in thousands of dollars and your independent variable is square feet. So you want to see how square feet is affecting house prices. And I want you to understand that this is just a simple regression model. It's just one X in the model. So we do have the data set here. What I did before today's class, I just copied this data set and I inserted into a CSV file. And I was able to replicate the results that you see on the slide. So I'm going to show you later uh, instead. So if you just have a scatter plot, right? A scatter plot between the dependent and the independent variable, you get some, what you see here is what we call the scatter plot is just the actual observation, right? This is, you can call it the population observations, right? This is not related to any estimation yet. Your goal is to try to fit a line, right? You want to kind of try to find the line that passes through most of these points. And when you try to get this line, this is what we call my estimation, right? So you try to get your estimation, which we call YI hat. And in this case, it's gonna be like house price hat. And each and every dot is just your Y, I, the true, the population, the actual. And of course, your goal is to try to get the point on the line, as you can see it right here. Those are the best points. A point that is far away, then it's an error term. This is a small, little bit smaller error term. This is a little bit bigger error term and so on. So you, your goal is to try to fit a line that passes through most of the points. And you actually hope that the, that the distribution of these points are kind of very tight around your line so that you get the smallest amount of errors as possible. Okay. What you have here is using Excel. So if you want to learn how to do it on Excel, you have the uh, instructions here, it's very easy. But what I'm going to show you is state. Okay, so I'm just going to discuss the results here and then I'm going to uh, show you uh, in state. So when you import the data set into state and you uh, use the regress command, the regress command would give you an output where you see the coefficients as we discussed last week. We had a coefficient where I had an intercept and I had a slope, right? And the intercept and the slope are actually, can be written into a linear form as you can see it here, just to make our life easy. And those are very important because this is how we're gonna read. Like they, they permit us to, they permit us to uh, read the or provide an analysis on these uh, on this regression okay so for example 
when you get the 98.2483, of course, you can always approximate this number to do up to two decimals. We don't have to see like this whole number of decimals right here. So what we can say here is the intercept is always the value of the dependent variable at zero independent variable or at zero square feet. Okay, so at zero square feet, the price is equal to 98.24. And of course, we said this is in thousands. So you just multiply this number in thousands when you try to analyze your results by saying, if I have a house that does not have any square feet, like just a zero square feet, the price would be 98,248.33 cents. And of course, this doesn't make any sense because if I have zero square feet, doesn't make it right a price that you shouldn't expect. So uh, that you you will have a doesn't make any sense. The the price of the house is equal to ninety eight thousand two hundred and forty eight approximately. If I have zero square feet, so in this situation, you would basically say I do have a mathematical meaning, but no economic meaning. What about the slope. The slope is very important and it would, it would like give us um, the impact of the or the impact on the housing prices because of the change in square feet. Okay, so how square feet, inc how the increase in square feet per one unit affects the housing price. Okay, so here uh, it's easy to read it. So the average value of the house increases by the slope, you multiply it times thousand, so you get a sense out of your results. And then for each additional square feet, there is an increase of $100.77, okay? Uh, and this is always on average because I have many houses. I don't know the observations, it's not like huge. It's how many houses we have. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten houses. So we have to say on average because uh, the, you're not talking about a specific house, but you're talking about on average based on the estimation of my model, right? Uh, this is what we get. Okay. Um, the other thing is. the variance decomposition so as i mentioned um uh, about the uh, the uh, r square the r square like the source of the r square is coming from the variance decomposition okay um just the different notations so different textbooks have different notations but by the end it's the same equation right so the some of the square total i wrote, i wrote it as tss it's the same okay uh, some of the squared residual is the explained sum squared. This is, sorry, some of the squared regression is the same as explained sum squared, okay? And then the SSE is the error sum squared, which I wrote as, uh, I wrote it as SSR. So it's the same, okay? So in order not to get confused, it's the same. Just focus on this part. It's the same equation, okay? So why are you using this? We're using this in order to be able to compute the distance between each dot and the estimation, right? And whatever I get here, it's related to the error term, right? This distance is error term, but I do have an average and this is the explained part, right? And the total is simply this part plus this part. So this is kind of the graphical representation of what we are uh, seeing. And then just go over the slides and just, it's the same thing, but just it's uh, some of the squared regression, I call it some of the square, explain some squared, it's the same. Okay, it's exactly the same. This is just then a graph that's showing you something which we call perfect, right? When I say R squared is equal to 100% explanation because all the dots are just on the line. Whether this line is negative relationship, it's positive relationship, it's just 100% explanation. So this is one of the cases that I would say, wow, I got like perfect result ever. Um, this is something that is more expected. Uh, of course, the more tightly are the points around the line, 
the better. Okay, you want this to be like small range as much as you can. Of course, this one is it's not as good as this one. Okay, because it, seems, it looks like these points are kind of more spread around the regression line. So this one, you would expect it has a high R square as compared, like the upper one has a higher R square as compared to the lower uh, one. Okay. Uh, this one has no explanation, as you can see. So no linear relationship between Y and X. As X increases or decreases, like whether X moves this way or this way, the range of observations are kind of moving around the same Y. So Y does not change. Despite the fact I have some points up and, and below the line, but still their averages, because every time we talk about the average, right? But on average, it's not moving. Okay. Um, sorry. So when you get the coefficients, this is where we did explain the coefficients. Last week, we explained the T, the, the T statistic, the p-value, the confidence interval, and how can we determine the statistical significance. So I'm not going to discuss this again today. We're going to focus, focus on the upper part of the table where we get the output of the regression. Every time you get, the output that you see here is just an Excel output. But it would be, it's very similar to the state output as I'm gonna show you. And um, you will also get the regression, sum squared, which we use it in order to get the upper part of the R square. The total sum squared, the lower part of, or the denominator, you divide these two, you get the R square. And in your uh, assignment for this week, uh, you have output and I'm asking you to get the R square, get the adjusted R square. So you just follow the formulas that you have. All right. Um, okay. The sigma squared, which is the notation for the population, it's uh, equal to the sample sum squared errors. And then remember when we said in, uh, when I was writing this, I, when I get the square root, I get the standard error of the estimate or I said the standard error of the regression. So this part, I call it the standard error of the regression. I hate to call it the estimate. I prefer to call it regression. So standard error of the regression, but it's the same equation. Okay. All right, so I want you to go over this and um, let me show you in Stata. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to share with you the output in Stata. So, okay. So I have created this do file and this do file has some replications of uh, the regressions we're talking about. So let's see. The first one actually is a very simple one. So we have the data set for housing prices. I actually just copied them from the slide and then I put them into uh, a CSV file and just imported them, okay? So I do have this here and then the regression, you just type regress, the Y, the X. And then once you're done, you just, you get the output. So what about this output? This is similar to the Excel output, right? We have discussed this column, this one, this one last week. So this lower part, as I mentioned last week, we are done with that. So what about the upper part? Okay. so. The upper part, the, we have the model sum squared or the explained sum squared. So the model sum squared or the explained sum squared or the regression sum squared are the same, okay? Which is the extent of the explanation in the model. And then the residual sum squared, it's the SSR. And then the total sum squared is simply the addition of these two parts and you get it here. 
the degrees of freedom, okay? So the degrees of freedom of the model sum square, I'm only, degrees of freedom that I lose in estimating the model sum squared because I have y i hat minus y bar. So I'm losing one for the estimation of y bar. And then what about the residual? The residual here, I have n minus k minus one. I have 10 observations minus k, I have one k, and I have one for the intercept. So I'm left with eight. What about the mean? You just take this one, divide by this one, you get this one. Again, this one, divide by this one, you get this one. And of course, the addition of these two would give you the total degrees of freedom. And if you divide this by this, you get the total mean square. So based on these numbers, you can actually get everything that you see here. Okay, so you already know that, for example, the R square, I, in order to get the R square, I take this number, which is the 18, whatever, 934, this number, and I divide it by the total, I will be able to get the R square. What about the adjusted R square? You need to use the adjustment of degrees of freedom. So remember, it's gonna be like this, divided by this, right? Because I have an adjustment of degrees of freedom. And the same for the total sum squared. So you would be able to get the adjustment, adjusted R squared. Uh, the root mean squared error, I gave you the equation. So you just follow the equation and you'll be able to get this number. So we're kind of done with everything here except the F statistic and its key value. So what we're gonna do next is we're just gonna talk about these two, why we need these two okay and uh we're gonna talk about how to analyze them it's like a t statistic and it's p value so we need to go to the table and um and get the uh and get the critical value okay all right so uh let me go back to the slides So, so in the slides, um, I'm not going to go over everything. So let me see where is the, okay. So we have already covered the, the T statistic last time, right? So actually the remaining of this, uh, the remaining of this um, file, which is this topic or chapter 11, are things that we have already covered last week, which is uh, how can I compute the confidence interval and, and so on. So let me start from here. The F statistic, what is the F statistic? The F statistic is actually computed again from the numbers that I can see on the table, okay? Because I can see that I do have the which I, which I used to call the explained sum squared. If I divided it by the degrees of freedom, I will get the mean sum, uh, squared of the regression. So this one is called the mean square of regression. Okay. And it's actually equal to the sum of the squared of the regression. I used to call this one the explained sum squared because it's the explanation of the model. Okay, and then it's divided by k, which is just one x to be estimated. And uh, I have here the sum of the squared errors. If I divide it by n minus k minus one, because when I open the sum of the squared errors, which I used to call SSR, whatever, SSR or ESS or SSE, when you open each and every econometric textbook, you will find different name for it, but it's by the end, it's the same. Sum of the squared residual, sum of the squared errors, error sum squared, whatever. It's the same equation. It's the sum from I equal one to N of, uh, let me just, of the error term squared, that's it. But now when I open this one up, I know that it's made of yi minus yi hat. And I know that this one has the beta hat zero, has beta hat one, 
all the way up to beta hat k. So I do have k parameters to be estimated n1. So k n1. That's why we have the k and the one. All right. So um, okay. So the f statistic is used in order to get me or get us the ratio between the average, as you can read it here, the average explanation of the model over the average amount of errors, okay? And in other words, actually this one is used in order to give us an indication about the overall significance in the model, the overall significance in the model. I want to know, like I can tell, let's say from a regression based on T statistic, whether X1 and X2 and X3 are statistically significant or not. But it might be the case that I have one of the axes is insignificant, but when I look at the overall significance, they are statistically significant. So it's actually has um, uh, a null hypothesis that is, this one is similar to the t-statistic because here this one is just a simple regression. But if I have more than one x, then I would have more than one uh, beta So in, under the test. So if I have more than one x, the null hypothesis would be whether beta 1 is equal to 0, beta 2 is equal to 0, all the way up to beta k is equal to 0. And the alternative would be... Um, whether beta 1 is not equal to 0 and or beta 2 is not equal to 0 and or, so we keep going like and or, and or, and or, okay, or beta k is not equal to 0. And you actually hope that you can reject because if you reject the null, and when I'm going to reject, I'm going to reject again when the f that I calculate is greater than the F I get from the table, the critical value, okay? The F has like this graph has, um, make it looks like this, and I showed you before this, and this one has, is the rejection region, and this is the acceptance region. So if I can be here in the shaded region, then I'm rejecting the null. I'm rejecting what? I'm rejecting that the coefficient is equal to zero or this like mix of all coefficients are equal to zero. So I'm rejecting this and I'm accepting the alternative. And if I accept the alternative, then I'm going to have this conclusion and say, uh, the set of coefficients are I hope that you can read my handwriting, are uh, jointly statistically significant. So this is what you want to find out, whether the group of coefficients I have are jointly statistically significant or not. So you're actually hoping that you reject the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis is telling me they are not, they are not jointly statistically significant. But the alternative is telling me that, yes, their mix is statistically significant. And just notice the end or, because it might be the case that one of the x's is insignificant. But when I put them all together, they are jointly statistically significant, so I'm going to keep it. So the f statistic would allow you to have a situation where one of the axes is insignificant and you're keeping it actually in the model because the f statistic is telling you they are jointly, all the regressors in the model, all the coefficients of the regressors in the model are jointly statistically significant, so you better keep them in the model. Okay? So the f statistic, again, it's computed from the output we have in the model, okay? So up to here, you take them and then you estimate. And it's actually made out of the means. So you forget about the sum square and you could take it about, you talk about the means. So you're dividing the SS by the degrees of freedom and you get the MS, which is the means. And um, it's actually about the first two. So you take this number, divide by this number, you would get the F statistic of 11. Okay, and then based on the F statistic of the of 11, you 
you go to the table and you try to find out, okay, based on this F statistic, what is my critical value? You will have uh, different tables for the F statistic. You can have like the 5%, the 1%, again, the 10%, and you choose and each one in one page, in a separate page. So you choose the one, the level of significance that you want. Okay. Um, Okay, so one of the important things to uh, notice here is the degrees of freedom. I need the degrees of freedom so that I know where I'm looking in the table. Okay, so I need to know also the significance level. Okay, so let me try to show you the table I have. So the table, just giving you an example, so that you're not lost because we have three tables. So you need to make sure that you're going to the table that is this question saying 5%. So 5%. Okay, let me see if I can show you this because it's going to be too tiny. So I'm trying to take, I'm, I'm going to try to take a picture. So I need, let me first find. Okay. So let's, I'm going to try something. Okay. Okay, so this table. So I just took the picture. What do we have here? We have the degrees of freedom of numerator, degrees of freedom denominator, right? And then when we go back here, where is the, what is our, It's gone, wait, I think, okay. So one and eight, right? So the degrees of freedom I need to look at the table is one and eight. One for the numerator and eight for the denominator. So one and eight, and actually the number is five, three, two. So when you go here, I think I lost my, uh, when I took the picture, I think I lost the... Where is it? I can't find it. Anyway, so let me explain it here. I can find it, so I'm, I'm gonna explain it. So I found this one, 11.08 in the output, right? So you have something like this. 11, let me approximate 11.08. So I have the F, it's one side. And I found from the table, the critical value is 5.32, okay? And this 5.32, um, and I have the F from the table I found is equal to 11.08, right? I have very bad memory, yes, 11.08. So you can call this one as F from the table, and you can call this one as F critical value. I'm sorry, not F from the table, F uh, calculated, because this is the one that we calculate. calculate. So because he, this one is in the rejection region, then you would conclude, reject the null, conclude that you have joint statistical significance. So the square feet is statistically significant, okay? Again, this one makes um, less importance because I just have one X, right? I can always just follow the T statistic, but the F uh, is, like it's very useful when I have more than one X. So let me show you in chapter 12, okay? So save without, close without saving. So when I go to chapter 12, I'm gonna show you a multi-regression. And a multi-regression is, it's actually more useful. I'm gonna see an F that is more useful than the one I just showed you. So in a multi-regression, I'm not going to go over everything because 
I just want to first show you the F. So, the F statistic when I have more than one coefficient. Okay, so when I go here, when I'm testing all coefficients. Right, so you're testing all the coefficients in the model. You're testing the overall significance of the model. That's where the F is very helpful. Okay, it's very helpful because I'm doing a test for everything in the model. You can just write it this way as I did. Uh, I actually made it like each one is equal to zero, or you write it this way, and then you can write it in uh, and or and or, or you can just write it at least one of the betas is not equal to zero. So it's up to you. Okay. Um, so let me show you this example in Stata. So in this example, we have a multi-regression analysis where we are talking about, um, let me go at the start, which is actually going to start at, let me see this example. Okay. So. This one, uh, this example is about pie sales, and it's not in dollars. It's actually how many pies you uh, sell per week, okay? And uh, it's a function of the price of the pies, and it's a function of advertising per hundred. And um, you collected the data for 15 weeks. Actually, again, very, very small sample, right? But still, we can still estimate it, and then I took again this data set and I was able to replicate exactly the results that you see here. So we have a regression that, that we're trying to estimate how sales are affected by prices and advertising and we're trying to estimate these coefficients. right? And then these are again when you follow the Excel if you want but I'm going to show you in uh, data. So you get an intercept, you get the slope for the price and you get the slope for the advertising. How can we read that? So again, you know this, this one is actually the number of pies sold. So we have about 300 and 307 pies sold uh, at zero price and zero advertising, which makes no sense. Okay. Uh, it's very important to notice what are the units of measurement that you have. I'm talking about sales, which is the number of pies. The price is in dollars. Advertising is in hundreds. So it's important because this is the way that you're going to analyze the results. What about the beta one? It's negative. This one is telling me something that we would expect. Price has a negative relationship with demand. So as the price increases by $1, this is the unit of measurement, the sales of pies would decrease by 24.975 pies. And since we're not allowing for fractions of pies, so you can say 25 pies. Okay, and it's very important to say in the same sentence that you're holding advertising constant because there is no change in advertising. If I'm talking about the price, I'm holding this one constant. If I'm talking about advertising, I'm holding price constant. So the next one, which is the partial slope of advertising, this one is basically telling us on average, there is a 74 pies per week for each $100 increase in advertising because the unit of measurement is 100 it's not one dollar is 100 and again holding constant the effect of price or holding constant the changes in price um, the computation of the r square is the same as i told you so there is no change here um, it's the same equation so you can use the uh, output that you get in Stata to compute the R square, it's already computed, but you can replicate the number to make sure that you understand. The same thing for the standard error of the regression, all what you need to do is to adjust for degrees of freedom, N minus K minus one. Um, the adjusted R square, I showed you that, so we adjust uh, four degrees of freedom. So the main difference between R square and adjusted R square is the addition of um, or the adjustment of degrees of freedom. This is how you read it. 44.2% of the variation 
because it's a variance decomposition, so you have to mention it's about the variation. In the pi sail is explained, because it's about the explanation, uh, by the variation in price and advertising, and taking into account that we have adjusted for the degrees of freedom, so taking into account the sample size and the number of independent variables the sample size and the number of independent variables. Okay. Um, what else? One of the important things that we can do is also we can compute the confidence interval. So this is something that I've discussed last time. I just want to show you the prediction. So, Okay, this is something that we have done. How can I analyze the statistical significance of coefficients? If you want me to repeat just anything, uh, please type on the chat. Okay, tell me, I'm gonna ask. Do you have any question? Just respond, so yes, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so um, this is again the computation of the overall significance. So we have mentioned that already. Let me just show you the, there is something I wanted. Yes, the prediction. How can I use the model to predict? Okay, so I already got the output of the betas, but then I might have a question about, can you predict for me the sales for a week? in which the selling price was $5.5 per pi and the advertising made was 350. And remember that the unit of measurement of advertising is in hundreds, so you would need to divide this one by 100 and plug in this information into your model and get the predicted sales price, uh, the predicted sales of pies. So you just, all what you need to do is after you got your, you got your estimation, you plug in the values that you have in the question, 5.5, plug it for the price, you divide this by 100 and you plug it in here, you multiply, add and subtract, and you just get the final answer. Let me show you this, how you do it in Stata. So let me share with you um, the desktop. So, This is the pie sale data set. Okay, so before you can have multiple data sets in one do file, but make sure that you clear every time before you start a new estimation, because otherwise you would get an error message telling you you have already a data set in. And then uh, we get the new data set, we estimate. Okay, and look at where is my state. Okay, and you get the results. Okay, so there is nothing new here. It's exactly what you see on the slide. So this is exact replication of the numbers that you get. Okay, um, what can we say about the F statistic? Just trying to make, to just move this, it doesn't work. Okay, so anyway, I can read it. Uh, so the F statistic is 6.5 and what you have here are the degrees of freedom used. You can actually make your life easy instead of going to the table, you can just read the p-value of the F. So what is this telling me? This one is telling me if I multiply this times 100, there is a 1.2% probability that the null is true. And of course the 1.2 probability is much smaller than the 5% and the 10%. So you can say under the 5%, the, uh, or the price and advertising, right, are jointly statistically significantly explaining the variations in sales, or they are jointly statistically significant, okay? because this one is a very low probability. It's lower than the five and it's lower than the 10. So based on the 5% or the 10%, you can say that the coefficients of the model are statistically or jointly statistically significant. Okay. Next, if I want to do predictions, 
uh, what I have here is showing you how can I extract the coefficients. What do you mean by extracting the coefficients? I want to get these coefficients out, right? So the coefficient of the P, the coefficient of advertising, the coefficient of the constant, and I want to make just a nice representation of my results. So how can we do that? You can do it by the scalar command. The scalar command would allow you to extract the coefficients and whatever is before the equal sign is something that you name it whatever name you like. So I prefer to call it the beta of P. Okay, beta underscore P. And whatever you see after the equal sign is something that you have to do it this way. So theta would understand that um, you need uh, theta to go to the B matrix where it has the, or the beta matrix that has all the coefficients of the regressors you have. And then you're asking theta to go to this B matrix and get the coefficient of P. And again, the next one is uh, I'm going, you're going to ask theta to name the coefficient of advertising as beta advertising. And it's by going to the beta matrix and get the coefficient of advertising. The same thing for the beta zero or beta constant. I call it constant, you can call it beta zero, whatever, or beta node. And then this one is a little different. It has an underscore here, another underscore before the constant. And then what you need to do next is you're trying to generate the sales hat, the estimation of sales. Okay, and you name it, you can call it the S, so you can call it sales predicted value, whatever. And it's equal to the constant plus beta 5.5, beta advertising 3.5. So this one is we're trying to actually answer the question. What is the predicted sales for a week in which selling price is 5.5 and advertising is 350? So here the display command is asking Stata to display for you the result nicely, okay? You don't have to do this in an exam, but this is something for your own uh, learning. So you would display the sentence and then whatever is not in red is the value. So it's gonna, Stata is gonna get the value of sale hat that was computed right here and it would kind of plug it into the sentence and this is, is in, oh, actually this one, it's, uh, it's not in dollars, it's my mistake. This is in pies, right? So how many pies were sold, okay? So I'm gonna save this. So we did the regression now this is the step where we're extracting the coefficients. We're putting them into a new variable called sale hat and then we're displaying the results. Okay, so. So the display command is nice because it will give you like one sentence, right? The predicted sales price is equal to the same number that we got on the slide, all right? Okay, so I'm going to give you a break. So let's see. Now it's 2.04. Uh, now actually it's 2.05. So let's have a break. Uh, five minutes. And let's return at 2.10. And when we come at 2.10, I'm going to ask you to start the practice. If you want to start it now, that's perfectly fine. Um, the, um, the password is P8 small uh, letter P, eight, number eight. You can start it now if you wish, or you can wait until five minutes rest and then you can start it right after, all right? So I will be back. All right.
Okay, everyone. <clears throat> Are you able to access the practice? No? Why? <clears throat> Let me check. Oh, you want the DTA file, okay. <clears throat> All right, just a second. You can have it actually in the, inside the, the practice, but uh, let me try to Share it. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to email it, okay, because it doesn't allow me to send it in the chat. So I'm going to email it to you right now. Okay, I just uh, emailed it. Uh, I think you can open the data description, right? It's a Word document, but let me know if you cannot. I'm going to... Okay, I just did. Guys, you can open your mic if you have any question, like you can open the mic, um, ask me any question and then mute it back. <clears throat>
I have just also uh, emailed you the, the Word document description file in case you cannot open it. <clears throat> If you have any question, uh, you can either uh, type in the chat or open your mic. Okay, now it's 2.20, so let me give you 15 minutes. So 2.35, we're supposed to finish by that time.
Okay, so then you're asking me about question four. So let me check. So it's asking you about your, um, uh, the statistical significance of the coefficient, right? So you have different options. You have the t-statistic, you have the p-value, you have the confidence interval of this um, variable. You choose whatever, you know, whether you want to base your uh, conclusion on the t or the p or the confidence interval and you decide. Does that answer your question? You can open the mic if you have, uh, if you have further questions. Okay, guys, we, sh we should be starting soon. So, <clears throat> are you almost done? Just type yes, no. Okay. Okay, then if you're confused, just open the mic and let me know what is exactly your question.
Actually, the last uh, two questions, I'm going to explain them later. So I'm going to uh, just try your best and I'm going to uh, like uh, add like a point zero for these for the last two questions. Hey guys, like uh, five more minutes and we're gonna start. Okay, guys, are you done? Okay. What about the rest? So, Mohammed and uh, Dan, are you done? Okay, Mohammed, one minute.
All right, everyone. So uh, let's continue. So okay. All right. So the remaining part of chapter twelve is uh, different variations on the model. Uh, one of them is nonlinearity. So whatever we have seen so far is actually a linear model. A linear model in which I have y is a function of x1 and x2 and x3 and so on, and everything is just linear. One of the possible variations is to add a quadratic term, which is like x squared. And this would happen when, um, let's say, I have a graph like this. So in this graph, whatever we have been doing uh, was just a straight line. So let's see if you check like this red line here in this um, graph on the top left. Uh, as you can see, the red line is straight and this is linear. But what if the dots, which is the actual observations, these dots are the actual observations. What if these dots are taking a shape that has some curvature uh, telling me that it's possibly uh, increasing at a decreasing rate, it's possibly polynomial. So the best fit would be something like this, right? It's increasing and then reaching a certain uh, maximum and then start to decrease, decrease, and then maybe the slope is gonna be constant. Also, if you check the residual or the error term, the error term of a nonlinear model would look like a curvature with the x. So whether you can check it with the y or whether you can check it with the error term of the model, both would give you the same answer. Okay, why is it the case? Because actually the error term is made out of the y, like this error term is made out of the y. It's y minus y i hat. So I can either uh, check the graph of y with the x or the error term with the x. They both would give me the same answer. Okay, if I have uh, something like this, which is points above and below the zero, then I can say that I possibly can go up or below the line, up and down, but on average, I can fit a line in the middle of all of these cycles and it would give me a zero amount of errors. So if this is the case, then I would say I have a nonlinear fit. Okay, so these are different shapes of a nonlinear model. It all depends on whether the beta one is positive versus the beta two and whether the beta two, like the signs of the two coefficients, this one and this one. And just notice that they are the same variable. So if this is square feet, this is square feet square. Okay. So if I have the beta one is negative and the beta two is positive, then I would get this shape. If I have both positive, then I would get this shape and both negative, this shape, and both one, I mean like the beta one is positive, the other one is negative, this shape. So this one is telling me the relationship between x1 and y is decreasing at an increasing rate. This one is increasing at an increasing rate. This one is decreasing at a decreasing rate. And this one is increasing at a decreasing rate. So it's always the case that the beta one is about the direct effect and the beta two is the rate of change. Okay. Um, so if I have a model and I'm not sure whether I do have a quadratic effect or not, then I need to test it. And to test it means that I need to check the statistical significance of the quadratic term. Okay, so the statistical significance is just like, again, you can choose the T statistic, the P value, you can choose the confidence interval, any one of these, where you can use it in order to be able to determine whether the beta two is statistically significant or not. So if it turns out to be um, that you are able to reject the null, if you can reject the null, then you're able to say that I actually need 
the quadratic term because it improves the model. Okay, so if I reject the null that this coefficient is equal to zero, then I'm accepting the alternative that it's not equal to zero. In other words, I'm saying that it's needed in the model, it improves the model. Okay. So one of the examples that you can do is just you can check the t-statistic, okay? The t-statistic of the coefficient is one of the ways that you can use in order to check the statistical uh, significance. You can also check the R-squared, where the R-squared is telling us the improvement in the explanation of the model. So if I have, um, if I, let's say, compare this model versus this model and I can see that the adjusted R square is increasing or the R square is increasing then I'm going to say okay in, 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 uh, including the quadratic term has improved the explanation of the model and it's an indication that it's needed in the model. One of the examples I'm going to show you on Stata is actually the relationship between uh, purity and the filter time. And we're expecting this relationship to be nonlinear, which means that as time increases, purity increases, right, at a decreasing rate. And then um, you would have a regression where you have the measure of purity and then the time, and you're seeing that it's positive, it's a relationship but you want to check whether this effect is uh, quadratic or not. One way actually can do it also is to check the error term, because as I said at the beginning, it can either check Y or the error term. Where is it? Yes, here. Y or the error term. So you can choose to use either the relationship between the X and the Y or the X and the error term. So here it's the X, the time, and the error term, as I can see, that it, it is very obvious it's not linear. Okay, so it's non linear. Okay, um, so adding the quadratic term of time, as we see it here, uh, we can see that it's statistically significant. The T statistic is very high 7.5. So based on the, or even actually just looking at the p-value, it's very, very, very small, right? It's scientific number. It's almost zero. So this one is telling us that there is almost a zero probability that the null is true. In other words, that the time squared is statistically significant and is needed in the model. It improves the model. Also, when you check the residual plot, when you're plotting the residuals versus the time square, you're seeing now that it's not taking any shape, right? It's kind of a random. So this one was a violation of the OLS assumptions that we have talked about last week when we were saying that we assume that the residuals are random, independent of each other. This one doesn't seem to be independent. Right? It's taking a certain shape, like each and every point is kind of connected with the previous uh, or the next point of observation. So it's, it's not um, independent, it's not random. But if I can get it random, then I'm going to say it's needed in the model. Okay? So the residuals are now random when I do have a quadratic term. So let me show you this in Stata. So I'm going to share with you again the code. And okay, so the next part in the code, again, as I'm telling you, we can actually keep on using different data sets on the same do file, but just make sure that you keep notations so that you're not confused. So here, this is the purity data set. And again, you clear, so you have to clear whatever was in the data set and then you uh, import a new data set. And let's see a scatter plot. So scatter a command is a scatter plot of purity and time and then a regression. Okay, so let's do that. So as you can see, this is the replication of the graph that you have 
um, on the slide. So it's, as you can see, it's going up, right? And what else? The regression, uh, we were able to replicate it exactly the same. Um, the adjusted, the, the R square and the adjusted R square are almost very, very, very close. Both are very high. So there is a, about a 97% explanation of the model. But about the statistical significance, this coefficient is telling me as time increases by one unit, the purity increases by 5.98, let's say 5.99 points. And it's statistically significant at all conventional levels because it exceeds the critical value of all the levels and also the 0% probability that the null is true. And also the confidence interval does not include the zero. So whether you base your conclusion on this, on this, on this, you will get the same answer in terms of statistical uh, significance. So now let's go ahead and then uh, create, um, I'm gonna leave this to later. So let's see. What about a scatter plot with the time? Now let me let me try this one first. So the quadratic term. So the quadratic term we generate a quadratic term by calling it generate time sq, where time squared. Again, you call it anything you like, and then time this symbol and then two. This would create the square term for you. All right. And then next, we, what we want to do is we want to include it in the regression. So we include in the regression, we're able to get exactly the same results that we were able to get on the slide. And we actually got a higher and even higher. It's already high, very high. But we were able to, to get an even higher um, R square and an adjusted R square. Okay, so it was like, what, it was 96? About 97? Now it's almost 99. Okay, so this is how you create a, a, a square term or a quadratic term. And if you have a question about whether your model is quadratic or linear, or if you have a question in a different way by saying whether the quadratic term is needed, so you need to check the significance. If it is statistically significant, then needed. If it is insignificant, then you, you're basically going to conclude that it's not needed. Okay, um, of course, when you go to your next level of the econometrics course, you would be able to explore different other versions of nonlinearity. I mean, like polynomial models, where you have to the power three, to the power four, or even higher um, orders. Uh, but for our um, course, we're just gonna do the quadratic term and, I was, and again like it's the same conclusion where I just look at the statistical significance of the just the very last term I don't really care about the time itself I care about the quadratic term of time if it is statistically significant then we're gonna say it's um, uh, it's needed okay I have a question can you post this to file on Sakai yes I can yeah no problem all right, so I'm going to post it under the, the week 12, and I'm also going to post this lecture uh, right after we're done. Okay. All right, so uh, let's uh, go back to the slides. And in the slides, I'm going to show you, show you another version of nonlinearity. So the other version of nonlinearity that we will talk about is log models, logarithmic models. and um, Many of the applications that we have in econ economics uh, uses log models. So this is the quadratic that we were just able to uh, compute. The log models is, if I have a model that is nonlinear of this form, okay? Uh, if you remember from macroeconomics, the Cobb-Douglas production function. So, the Cobb Douglas production function. The Cobb Douglas production function is actually is made out of an exponential model where I have labor to a certain power and I have capital or physical capital to a certain power and so on. Um, 
estimating nonlinear models of this form is really is really challenging. So one way to make it easy or make it easier, mathematically easier, is to linearize it. So linearize it means that you're taking the log of this model and you were able to get this model. And if I'm able to get this model, that I, then I can actually estimate it and I will be able to get the estimators of beta one and beta two. And of course, my analysis would be, a diff would be different because here it was about the X, but now here it's about the percentage change in X because the log model would be, would be giving me an, um, like a percentage approximation. So whenever you see a model that has logs, then you would understand, okay, this model is about the percentage change in Y due to the percentage change in X1, percentage change in X2. This would be your um, objective when you're trying to analyze a log, log model. So the log log model, one of the very famous applications is elasticity. If you remember again from your macro model, macroeconomics uh, intermediate uh, macro, you were talking about the percentage change in demand of good X because of the percentage change in the price of good X holding all other uh, factors constant. This one is actually can be written in terms of log. So you would be saying, okay, what is the log of price? as a function of beta naught plus beta plus beta one times the demand for log log of the demand for good x and the price of x okay uh sorry sorry i just flipped the equation because it's uh, let me just read it uh, type it again i flipped it based on the so here i'm trying to analyze how the percentage change in demand due to the percentage change in price. So the demand is my dependent variable. So here I'm gonna have like log dx is equal to beta naught plus beta one log px. And in this situation, I'm going to be estimating uh, an elasticity model, okay? And again, for the requirement of our course, we're not going to spend so much time in analyzing log models. It's just enough that you understand that there is something called a log model. I'm gonna show you how to estimate it in Stata. But when you go to the next level of econometrics, whether it's with me or with Professor Chu, uh, we will be spending three lectures at least on log models. Uh, and log models, we will be talking about log, log models, log linear model, linear log model. So we have three different variations of the logarithmic transformation. Okay? All right. Uh, again, so as I, meant, I mentioned that already, so it's all about percentage change. So to interpret the model, it's nothing about any linearity. It's all about percentage change, okay? So it's a very good application is elasticity. And we, we do um, study the price elasticity of demand in both the introduction to macro and the intermediate level macro. The other type of nonlinearity is called interaction models. Okay, so interaction models is a model in which I do have, you can think of interaction as multiplication. Okay, so um, before we talk about the interaction, we talk about the dummy variable. So we or you already know that a dummy variable is simply a variable that takes two levels, zero or one. Okay, so if I have a variable like here, again, our same model, the pi sales, how many pies you sell based on the price and whether there is a holiday or not, okay? So one stands for the holiday, zero for no holiday. And before you do any analysis, you should have some expectations in mind. And the expectation is either based on what you have studied in macro or micro or what makes sense to you. So what makes sense for, we haven't studied the effect of a holiday, right? But it makes sense that we expect in a, when, when, it, when it's a holiday during the week, we expect the sales of pies to increase. So when you include this dummy, the dummy, uh, let me go back here. So this one, it's gonna take one or zero. So if I'm asking you, okay, what about the 
estimation of sales during the holiday. So you would plug one here. So one would be multiplied times the beta two, and the beta two is the addition to the new to the original intercept. I want you to notice that nothing happened for beta one. So the impact of price on sales is the same whether there is a holiday or no holiday. And it's it might not be realistic, right? We also we would expect that the slope would change. But based on what you see in this model, the functional form of this model does not allow us to make the slope changes whether there is a holiday or not, but we can make it change, right? So let's see first when we have um, the same slope. So if I have the same slope, whether there is a holiday or no holiday, so it's no interaction here, or there is no change, I should say. And then here we have a new intercept. So we have a different intercept, one for the holiday and one without the holiday. And of course, when I'm talking about an intercept, it affects the height of the regression. So if this is beta zero or the original regression, assuming that beta two is positive, then I'm gonna have a jump everywhere in this regression line. And it's parallel because they do have the same slope, right? So they do have the same slope. The only thing that is different between these two regressions is the intercept, okay? Um, so what you can read here in this square, you can check whether the effect of holiday is significant or not. Like you can have this regression and I'm asking you, do you think that having a dummy that represents a holiday is important or not? Again, it's the same um, way that you have done with the quadratic term. You go ahead and you check the t-statistic or the p-value or the confidence interval of this parameter. And if it turns out to be statistically significant, then you will be, tell, you will be saying, okay, it makes, um, it may, there is a statistical significant difference between a holiday and no holiday in terms of pi sales. All right. Again, if you have any questions, just stop me. All right. So, when I have a dummy in the model, like here, and you have estimated the model, whether it's a holiday or no holiday, and then you get a number. What about this number? How can I, what can I uh, say about this number? If I stop up to here, like if the regression is just here, which is the original regression, it's telling me that the sales of no holiday are 300 pies, and this is gonna be at zero price. However, because of the holiday, this number increases by 15 pies. So the analysis here is important. And remember, we need all the time to mention the word on average, because I do have many observations, right? I have multiple points of observations. And this is not going to be talking about just one point. It's talking about the average of all of these observations in my sample. So on average, the sales were 15 pies greater in weeks with a holiday than in a week without a holiday, given the same price or holding the price constant. Because I'm not, anytime I'm analyzing one factor, I'm holding the other factor constant. If I'm analyzing the price, I'm holding holiday constant and vice versa. Okay. All right. So now let's allow the slope to differ. Whatever we had before is just the slope is not different. The slope is 30 all the time. Anytime the price increases by $1, the pie sales is gonna fall by 30 pies. Now let's make this differ whether I do have a holiday or not, okay? So now we're talking about an interaction term. Interaction term is actually, you can call it multiplication term. I have a multiplication between two variables. Why I'm doing that? Because let's say I want here to analyze or the beta one is analyzing. So I'm not talking about the whole thing. I'm just talking about the coefficient. So the beta one, so the beta one is analyzing the effect of X one on Y holding constant X two. This one, analyzing the effect of x2 on y holding constant x1. Now, what if I want to have both effects simultaneously? I will need to multiply them together. So what if I multiply them together? Let's call them x3, okay? 
you can just multiply, you don't have to call them X3. You can just, if you're confused, just focus on number two here. So beta three would be measuring the simultaneous effect of X1 and X2 on Y, okay? So by looking at this function and I'm asking you, what is the effect of, just gonna clean this mess. So by looking at this function, I'm telling you, what is the effect of, uh, let's say if we are interested in the effect of X1 only. So I'll be interested in like the first derivative. Let's try to, to type it here. So what is the change in YI hat because of the change in X1? So I'm trying to get like the first derivative of this function with respect to x1. And if I'm doing that, then it's going to be beta 1 plus beta 3 x2. So this result is telling me that the effect of x1 on y depends on x2. So without the interaction term, I would stop here, right? I would just stop here and say, okay, the slope of or the partial slope of x1 is equal to beta 1 but now because i do have an interaction term i have to add this additional part and this additional part is telling me that the effect of x1 on y depends on the, whatever values taken by x2 this is again another form of nonlinearity. so whatever we have discussed so far is um, we have discussed the first type of nonlinearity, quadratic model. So this was the first thing that we have discussed in terms of nonlinearity or different variations that we can have in the model. The number two we talked about log um, logarithmic models. Logarithmic models and, and this is models. Models number three is the one that we we're just talking about which is the interaction model. Those are three types of nonlinearity. I'm not gonna have a straight line, right? My regression is going to be either with some curvature, whether this way, whether this way, whether it's like this, right? Depends on whether it's a more than quadratic and so on, like higher order of polynomial, all right? So um, this is what the, uh, the interaction term would allow us to um, estimate, okay? All right, so what's next? Okay, so yeah, it's just like repeating what I was saying, the effect of an interaction would make the effect of X1 on Y to depend on X2. Whatever value of X2 is, uh, use it in order to get the impact of X1. Uh, another example here is that suppose that I have x2 is a dummy value, okay? It's not continuous, it's a dummy value. And the estimated regression, just a very, very simple model, right? It's this intercept is equal to one. The coefficient of x1, two, coefficient of x2, three, coefficient of the interaction term is four. And I'm saying that suppose that I have a dummy that is x2, so this x2, is a dummy that takes one or zero. And I want you to imagine that what happens if this taking one. So if it takes one, then three times one, and I already have another constant here. So I have actually to add these two up. I'm going to have a new intercept, all right? Next, when X2 is equal to one, this is not affected. I don't have any X2 here. Uh, I do have an interaction term with x2, so it's taking one. So 2x1 plus 4x1 is going to give me 6x1. So that means when I have an interaction term uh, that is actually, it, it, like there are two important things. So it's an interaction term and it's also directly included in the regression. So it's directly included in the regression separately and also as an interaction term. And if this happens, then I'm gonna have a change in slope and a change in intercept. 
the previous case, like in the previous uh, example, we had just uh, a change in intercept and we were holding the slope constant. It wasn't affected, right? Now what we have is an interaction term that is interacted with one of the variables and that's why, and also it's included directly in the model, so that's why it's affecting the intercept and it's also affecting the slope. What's going to happen if it is equal to zero? So everywhere I see x2, I plug zero. So it's zero here, zero here. So I'm going to go back to the original model where I have just one variable x1. It's actually here also one variable, right? So this is again one variable and here is again one variable, but the magnitude of the slope is different and the magnitude of the intercept is different, right? Different slope, different intercept, okay? Any questions? Okay, good. All right, so we have six minutes left in today's lecture. So let's uh, continue here. So the significance of the interaction term. Significance of the interaction term, again, whatever I've said here about the quadratic term, right? When I have a quadratic term, how can I tell whether it's needed or not? I just need to check the statistical significance. So again, what you need to do is to check the statistical significance of the interaction term. And if it is statistically significant, then it's needed. If it is not, then it's not needed and you can easily remove it from the model, okay? So you check the t statistic of the coefficient attached to the interaction term. In this case, we have beta three. Okay. If I reject the null hypothesis that it is equal to zero, then there is a difference in the slope coefficient for the two subgroups. Or you can in say that there is a statistical significant difference between having the interaction and not having it. So that means I actually need it in the model because it's statistically significant. So if you reject, then it's statistically significant which means keep it, right? So you have to keep it in the model. It's needed. Okay. Um, next, this is just a reminder and this is the part that would connect today's uh, topic with next week. And I just wanna remind you that today we were planning to cover chapter 13, but I didn't want to move fast. I just want to make sure that I'm covering each and every point in chapter 11 and 12. So what I'm going to do for next week is I'm going to adjust the materials of the week so that whatever we were supposed to cover today, I'm going to move them to next week. Uh, so here is just a connection with what we have talked about last week and what we will be talking about again next week. So the assumptions, we were assuming all the time, or OLS, ordinary squares, OLS assumes a very big assumption that I have normal errors, okay? So there is a normality of errors, errors are normally distributed. If you go back to last week uh, notes, you have the IID assumption. So I want to go back to the IID assumption. I want to go back to the expectation. We had like this one, expectation of the error term given the X is equal to zero. So I wanted to go back to these assumptions because these assumptions are related to the slide and also to the next week topic. Uh, also the other assumption is that the errors have a constant variance. So the variations of the errors above and below the line are by the end equal to zero, okay? And then the model errors are independent. So these assumptions, these are big assumptions. And if we evaluate any of these assumptions, then we will run into econometric problems. And this is what happens in reality. We don't have like this simple world in real life. In real life or in real models, we do go into non-normality, um, non-constant, variance, the model errors are dependent. They do depend on each other, especially if you're talking about interest rate, if you're talking about a situation like today, like now, what's going on in the world, whatever happens today is connected to tomorrow, it's connected to after tomorrow and actions taken by the government today are connected to what happened yesterday. So I really cannot take this assumption in real life. 
So what we, uh, we're going to talk about next week is the violation of these assumptions. What if I'm going to drop these assumptions and see how the model is going to perform in real life? Okay, what are the possible econometric problems that we would run into and how can we overcome it or deal with it? All right. Okay, so um, I want you to, uh, okay, so that's it for today. I want you to uh, just make sure to read chapter 11 and chapter 12. You can start at the assignment. We have covered everything on the assignment. So it's covering chapter 11 and 12. And if you have any question, you can always send me an email or post on the discussion forum. And I'll meet you on next week on Wednesday. And stay safe and stay well and take care. All right, bye.